Right, hello everyone. This is our class in the anthropology of religion, religion and rituals, as the class is properly entitled. Now we shall be looking uh, a we shall be looking at a fascinating topic for this week. It's the fifteenth week. We have another two weeks until the end of the semester. Today we shall be looking at a topic which is rather sensational. But it is, properly speaking, an anthropological topic in itself. It is a large chapter or a key issue in the modern scholarship of the anthropology of religion. I'm referring to works, to studies on neo-paganism and the New Age movement. Now, perhaps this latter definition, which I gave, the way I defined the topic is a bit elusive. Studies on neo-paganism and the, neo, the New Age movement. On the one hand, there are studies on neo-paganism which are written by practitioners themselves. And this is an interesting strand of scholarship, although perhaps uh, anthropologists may distance themselves. Anthropologists like you and me may dissociate themselves from actual practice Although, as we shall find out in a while, in major academic departments in Scandinavia and in other North European countries, in other North Euro European countries, it is academics themselves who are the leading exponents of New Age movements and various neo-pagan religions. But speaking of works written by practitioners, by actual religious devotees and neo-pagans. This is one of these works. It is by a neo-shamanist. We referred to neo-shamanism and the new age movement in our initial classes. And this was a section which followed the proper ethnographic materials on Siberian and inner Asian and Asiatic shamanism, shamanism in Asia. This is called Circle of Shaman Healing Through Ecstasy, Rhythm and Myth. I shall be referring to the elements of dance, trans states and collective communion, which are essential in these neo-pagan and neo-shamanistic religions. This is the, the cover, the front cover of the book. The author is called Karen Bergeron and is one of these neo-shamanic practitioners in the United States and in Britain and in other countries. Now, yes, this is just an indication of a large body of scholarship which has emerged in recent years. Now, this is the first strand of books which are written by practitioners themselves. I shall be referring to the nature of these works and to the motives of these practitioners in the process. The second strand of literature, which, which is what anthropologists are more interested in, is studies on the movements of neo-paganism and the New Age movement by anthropologists themselves. Now, uh, sometimes I feel, or my impression is that this distinction which I've introduced is not as neat and as absolute as I should have liked, or as I imagined before reading the review text by the author of our textbook by Brian Morris. It emerges that um, some anthropologists have been actually involved in these neo-pagan movements, but also it does emerge that many intellectuals, especially in Britain and in the, the northern European countries, in some of these northern European environments, are indeed involved in this revival or the reinvention of neo-pagan movements. And in a sense, they are an active intellectual part of the New Age movement in one way or another. Either as, either as practitioners or as chief ideologists in these movements. Therefore, it is important to keep in mind that this distinction which I've introduced between neo-practitioners who also write about paganism and 
anthropologists themselves who approach the neo-paganist movements from their own perspective is not always so clear cut and straightforward. But in this lecture, we shall be concerned with anthropological, with mainstream scholarly works on neo-paganism, although we shall introduce some works by some seminal figures in the field. And most of these figures were not just academics, but they were active practitioners and leading figures in the revivalist movements of the so-called ancient pagan religion in Europe, in Hungary, in Budapest, in uh, Scandinavian countries, in France, and of course, perhaps even more importantly, in Britain. Therefore, this is going to be our topic for this lecture, neo-paganism and the New Age movement, as you can see in the front page, right? Yes, right. Now, let me start by presenting two works, which are seminal readings, and each of these works is fascinating. The book on the left-hand side is this book, which I actually have, and I obtained this book when I was a postgraduate student at the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Now, Scotland is a place which is associated with a old pagan religions, with witchcraft, with a strand of New Age spirituality, which is called Wicca. And if one visits some remote regions in Scotland, one finds places which are in the woods, in, in exotic, in picturesque landscapes and forests. And there are even traces of such uh, practices, such rituals, which have been uh, practiced by members of some local revivalist cults. Um, or this is what I was told when I was a student there a long time ago. Now, more in, in relation to this scholarship, this book is called The New Age in Glastonbury, The Construction of Religious Movements. I've never had the chance to read the whole of the book. I've read some chapters. This is a fascinating work, as I said, and a thought-provoking work. One reason being that the authors are trying to understand from an anthropological perspective various social religious movements and they create a theory which is of broader applicability it can be applied to various movements in fact this book relates to one class which i was attending as a student it was called new religious movements and it was being taught by a, a, a very well-known anthropologist of Britain, of St. Andrews, David Riches. He was my supervisor in St. Andrews for one year. And Ruth, Br Ruth Prince is the co-author, or Ruth Prince is the main author, and David Riches, the co-author of the book. Well, all right. Yes, so they um, draw on such widely um, such anthropological concepts of wide currency as communitas, egalitarianism, individualism, holism, and autonomy. And the book focuses on individuals or on social groups, which consist of individuals who have abandoned a mainstream lifestyle, and they've come to construct a counter a counter-cultural way of life. Moreover, the authors draw on their work on shamanistic religions, on tribal shamanistic religions, and they point out interesting similarities between the latter and the Glastonbury New Age movements. Moreover, they extend this uh, approach and their analysis to a wide range of religious movements such as the Hadarites, the Kibbutz, and green communities. Yes, it's a fascinating work. And when I, as soon as I'm back to China, I shall definitely um, uh, introduce this book in my lectures whenever this 
um, whenever this opportunity emerges. Right, the book on the right hand side is by another famous anthropologist who writes on psychological and psychiatric anthropology. Her writings are brilliant. This book is called Persuasions of the Witch's Craft by Tania Lurman. The subtitle is Ritual Magic in Contemporary England. I shall be referring at least briefly to England. I shall be referring to England in the following uh, materials um, on the basis of two arguments or two themes. The first is the revival of pagan religion in England. And the second is the old witch hunts, which for some scholars provided evidence of the existence of a pre-Christian animistic and witchcraft related religion. The latter argument has been contested by historians as Keith Thomas, Keith Thomas, who is a very well known historian of early modern Europe and perhaps the later ages as well of modern Europe, starting from the 15th century and up until the 18th, 19th century, when magic accusations of witchcraft and fear about witchcraft was, um, was um, something of concern to the peoples at that time, gradually, progressively, as modernity settled in, um, in many of these European societies, ideas on witchcraft uh, declines and in fact Keith Thomas I think he has written a book which is called a modernity and the decline of witchcraft or something about the decline of magic and witchcraft uh, so it is important to uh, uh, try to approach witchcraft in relation to uh, the discourse on modernity which is central to the uh, transformation of European societies from peasants, from the domestic mode of production to capitalism. After all, as we shall find out in a while, many of these movements, which we shall consider, are, are not just counter cultural, they are also counter hegemonic. They're counter, counter hegemonic, and perhaps this is why some anthropologists like them. And also, uh, they are counter political movements or they counter any tendencies for centralization. So these are counter movements or counter political and counter centralizing movements, egalitarian, holistic, perhaps even family based. But some of these movements did have a sort of autocratic governance which was based on some kind of authority, either a sort of personality cult, which is represented by a powerful male leader, or a kind of authoritative text, which is the, the major corpus, which is leading the minds of the devotees and the cult enthusiasts, the members of these cults. On the other hand, as we shall find out, and I'm just pulling out some arguments and some strands from the materials which we shall consider. As we shall find out, uh, many of these women, uh, excuse me, many of these movements are, um, are preferred by women. It is women who are primarily members of some of these cults. And as we shall find out, this female penchant for these alternative ways of spirituality is based on supposedly old or ancient ideas about the mother goddess and about women who were practicing witches and who created a covenant, a mystical cult, which was persecuted by the Christian the male dominated Christian churches of the medieval periods. Right, yes, after this brief introduction, I've, I, I did my best to introduce as many of the topics which I shall be discussing as, as possible. Yes, I shall move on to the 
rust on the materials. I can't quite leave this wonderful pic this wonderful picture, with uh, which shows these uh, important works, fascinating readings. Now we shall just let me stay here for just one more comment. Let me just add one more comment to this um, part of the presentation. And this refers to Tanya Lurman's work, Persuasions of the Witch's Craft. Uh, I, as far as I remember, I've read the book a long time ago when I was a student, but it is both men and women who are participants in these covenants or these magic cycles to uh, recall a um, anthropological research seminar, which was uh, taking place in the Scott Polo Research Institute, where I did my PhD. It was actually called the Magic Circle, but it was a seminar series in anthropology. Right, okay. So uh, now Lerman says that something very interesting, which, which, which is about the social class of the participants in these uh, new religious movements. And this is that they mostly come from the upper social segments. They, these are the more affluent people, not the, not the peoples who are from the lower uh, classes of society, not the ones who are poor or marginalized, or in a sense who struggle to make um, to, to, to make a living, who struggle to survive. Um, instead, it is people who are coming from the higher levels of British society who are becoming members of these, um, of these religious groups. Now, yes, this does not mean that it is primarily the affluent people who are becoming members of these groups historically historically and this is something that an historian an italian historian carlo ginsburg has demonstrated it is usually people who are for the who are, who are coming from the more impoverished segments of the early european societies referring back to the medieval period who were becoming members of these cults the phenomenon of tarantism in italy tarantism these people claimed the members of this cult, which was a sort of trance and spirit possession cult, claimed that they became afflicted uh, after they, they had been uh, bitten by a spider. And in a sense, this was the cause of the affliction. Or this, it, it was perceived like that medicine and, and rational science were not developed at that time. And people had these ideas good for us to read yes all right so let's move on to the materials we've got plenty of materials to read and to reflect on let me just uh, in the meantime if you want you can send a question uh, i know that it's late for you but all right i hope it is interesting now as the author says there has been an upsurge of new religious movements of new religious movements in Western Europe and in the United States of America, starting from the 1970s onwards until nowadays. Now, as I said in the beginning, most of these movements are counter hegemonic and they, they have been born through the a wider counterculture movement of the 1960s, which was emphasizing a way of life um, not based on hierarchy, a more egalitarian lifestyle. It was the periods when movements of protest were um, uh, spreading like wildfire everywhere in the world. At the same time, this was a period of dictatorships, 1967 in Greece, Spain, was also a dictatorship and other countries, Balkan countries, Turkey also. So there were all kinds of radical tensions from different, from opposing sides. But many of these movements have had a significant social impact worldwide. 
ever since. Let me just mention several of them, which you might have heard. Uh, now, most people in Western countries, academics, have indeed heard of these movements. And some of these movements um, have, been, have been heard, they have become famous for tragic reasons and for really uh, disturbing consequences. But let me just mention several of them. The Church of Scientology. Scientology. Um, right, yes. The Divine Light Mission, the Unification Church, the Order, the Order of the Solar Temple, and the Hare Krishna movements. Yes. Now, all of these movements have some common features. More or less, they share a sort of common mentality and a common orientation. They're based on a, a radical distinction, on a radical distinction between the outside world and the community, which is closely knit, and a bounded community, which is highly exclusivist. And what members of these cults take an oath and uh, whatever they do is bound by heavy interdictions they should not speak about their cults and their practices to outsiders and and they should avoid any contact with the outside world in most cases so these 